Hi, this is uh, Chad Lang here. Uh, in this video, I want to uh, discuss the subject of spiritual abuse and what is spiritual abuse. Well, that's what we're going to find out today. I have this book here that my dear friend Mark uh, gave me. Um, uh, he is the co-host and uh, founding member for the uh, support group that I co-host for, After the Truth. And I have this book here, and it says, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse, Recognizing and Escaping Spiritual Manipulation and False Spiritual Authority Within the Church. Well, within the Church. Wow. Um, what is spiritual abuse? Well, that's a very good question. And we're going to dive right into the first chapter here and learn what that is. Uh, so I'm going to just put this on my dashboard here and we're going to read from this book. So, uh, dedicated to the weary and heavy laden, deeply loved by God, but because of spiritual abuse, find that the good news has somehow become bad news. So, Chapter 1, Help Me. Jerry sat in the office. Actually, before I read this, spiritual abuse is a real phenomenon that actually happens in the body of Christ. It is a subtle trap in which one, the ones who perpetuate or perpetrate spiritual abuse on others are just as trapped in their unhealthy beliefs and actions as those whom they knowingly or unknowingly abuse. What is spiritual abuse? How does it occur? Are you a victim? Chapter 1, help me. Jerry, uh, a woman, sat in the office of a Christian counselor explaining that she felt desperate and felt like she was going crazy. Either that, she said dryly, or dryly, or I'm on the verge of a major breakthrough in my spiritual growth. Those are two big opposites, the counselor noted. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, she began, choking up, I went to my pastor a few months ago because I was feeling depressed a lot. He pegged the root problem right away, but I can't seem to do anything about it. Root problem, the counselor repeated. What was that? Jerry looked down at her shoe tops. I guess I would have to say the problem is, well, me. My pastor says I'm in rebellion against God. What unfolded was an unfortunate and all too common case history. Jerry's church teaches that scripture is God's word, the standard by which we must live, but they use it as a measure by which we gain acceptance with God rather than as a guide for living. Therefore, when she was asked her pastor when she asked her pastor for help with her depression, she was given a prescription of praise scriptures to memorize and repeat over and over. This, she was told, would get her mind off herself and onto God. The depression would lift when she got over her sinful self-centeredness. Jerry had tried what the pastor suggested, but her depression didn't lift, and this raised some questions. She noted that there was a history of depression among the women in her family, and that she was present Lee experiencing some physical problems. Moreover, she confided to her pastor that she was struggling in her relationship with her husband because he shrugged off responsibilities with their two teenagers who were beginning to get into trouble. How did he respond when you said his suggestion didn't help? That's when he dropped the bomb on me, Jerry said. The counselor did not fail to notice her choice of metaphor. The devastation Jerry was trying to portray and asked, what sort of bomb? The pastor had told her, the fact that you won't accept my counsel without raising all these objections and other possibilities was the major indication to me. Jerry, that your root problem is spiritual, not physical or emotional. When you talked about arguing with your husband rather than submitting to him and trusting God, oh, liberals are going to have a huge one with that if you're any kind of feminist sensibilities whatsoever. That confirmed it. 
He concluded that the other problems, emotional depression, physical illness, a troubled marriage, and teenagers in tor turmoil were the result of her inabilities to submit fully to God and His Word. <laughs> wow. Jerry had tried to object. I told him I felt condemned, that I felt I needed some other kind of help. What happened? The counselor prompted. That made it worse. My pastor just smiled and said I wasn't willing to accept his counsel. So that proved he was right. That's when he used the R word on me. He said, Jerry, you need to repent of your rebellion against God. Then all these minor problems will be taken care of. That's a strong judgment against you, the counselor noted. What do you think about it? Tears welled up, and Jerry dabbed at them with a tissue. Then she sat, wringing the tissue in knots as she replied, I feel like a bug pinned down to a piece of cardboard. I try to praise God. I do praise Him. But the problem with my husband and kids goes on and on. And when I'm honest with myself, I get mad because just repeating scriptures when our family and our health is falling apart seems so shallow. But then I wake up in the middle of the night hearing my pastor's words and I think I must be a terrible Christian, in rebellion, like he said, or my life wouldn't be such a mess. He's right, isn't he? Rebellion is a sin we all need to deal with. But the turmoil in me has gone on for four months and I found myself thinking I should stick my head in our gas oven. So now she's suicidal. And other times I think I must be on the verge of a breakthrough to more holiness if only I could praise enough or submit enough. But I don't think I can stick it out long enough. I just feel exhausted and like I'm losing my mind. I can't carry all this weight anymore, she ended pleadingly. Help me. Jerry's dilemma is similar to countless cases we've encountered, representing a widespread and serious problem among Christians. The problem, as we have come to know it, is that of spiritual abuse. No doubt the term itself will disturb, if not shock, many people, though that is not our intent. Nor is our intent to be alarmist, though we are sounding a call that a problem exists. Therefore, it's important to define what we mean by spiritual abuse, and also to make it clear from the start that any one of us can be a victim, and sometimes even a perpetrator, without realizing what we're doing. To begin, let's examine the dynamics at work in Jerry's story. Anatomy of spiritual abuse. We could put a f our finger on several troublesome factors. Jerry's pastor ignored the physical, emotional, and relation relational dimensions of her problem and took a more narrow, spiritualized approach. With little investigation, he assumed he knew Jerry's root problem, that there was a root problem, but there are more subtle factors at work, and the subtlety is exactly what gives them their power to wreak great, wreak great damage. First, let's, let's examine the power dynamic at work. Jerry had voluntarily made herself vulnerable by sharing a problem. This assumed, of course, that her pastor was healthier in this same problem area or at least more knowledgeable, and that he could help. Because she felt weak in this area, help from someone stronger is what she was seeking. Add that to the pastor's position of spiritual authority, and it's easy to see how his words would have double weight in Jerry's thinking. And then, sadly, help is not what Jerry was offered. This is where a second dynamic comes in. The focus of the issue was subtly changed. Jerry went to talk about her problem of depression. The pastor addressed the problem as being Jerry herself. According to him, she was rebellious. So she was the problem. He shifted the focus from an, an emotion to the person, from Jerry's state of feelings to her state of being. Depression was no longer the problem to be worked through together. Jerry herself was the problem, labeled a rebel who needed to live up to a standard. Jerry never noticed that she was not receiving help, which is what she was hoping for. Instead, her spiritual position before God was being questioned, and it would appear 
judged. At the bottom of this sad, painful encounter lies perhaps the subtlest dynamic. Jerry questioned an authority who considered himself above questioning, perhaps even above error. Let's continue. Now, in a normal dialogue, for instance, you may misunderstand or disagree with me. If you question my thinking, and in fact your questions corrects an error I'm making, then your challenge was, a health, was healthy for me. It corrected me. But the simple fact that you question me does not make you wrong. Unfortunately, a more subtle set of assumptions were at work against Cherry. They went something like this. The pastor evidently interpreted his position of authority to mean that his thoughts and opinions were supreme. If he said it, her only right response should be to agree. Definitely not to object. Second, it was assumed that Jerry's questions were coming from a wrong spirit, not simply from an honest attempt to have give and take dialogue. In other words, the worst was assumed of her, not the best. More troublesome than that, frankly, was the power play that went on. In a word, Jerry was manipulated. No doubt Jerry's pastor thought he was only being honest and direct with her, trying to help her see her problem. Manipulation came into the picture when Jerry asked an honest question and he pulled rank. The unspoken attitude she met with might be best stated in words like this. I'm the authority, and because I'm the authority, my words are not to be questioned. Since you did question, it's proof that you're wrong. What does this attitude reveal? Perhaps insecurity, buried frustration, and anger. It also reveals that the pastor was, at least in this encounter, not functioning in a caring position for Jerry's benefit, though she needed him. On the contrary, it appears that she was supposed to affirm and bolster him by agreeing, regardless of how she felt and whether or not his assessment of her was accurate. Upholding his position of authority is what mattered most. What is spiritual abuse? Witnessing the spiritual anguish caused by dynamics like these have time to time is what led us to coin the term spiritual abuse. Having illustrated it with a case study, now let's define and apply the term. Spiritual abuse is the mistreatment of a person who is in need of help, support, or greater spiritual empowerment with the result of weakening, undermining, or decreasing that person's spiritual empowerment. This is a broad view. Let's refine that with some functional definitions. Spiritual abuse can occur when a leader uses his or her spiritual position to control or dominate another person. It often involves overriding the feelings and opinions of another without regard to what will result in the other person's state of living, emotions, or spiritual well-being. In this application, power is used to bolster the position or needs of the leader or parent. In the case of Mormonism, when parents are spiritual leaders and uh, Mormon doctrine uh, encourages uh, patriarchal obedience. Uh, where was I? Spiritual abuse can occur when spirituality is used to make others live up to a spiritual standard. This promotes external spiritual performance. External spiritual performance, that's important. Also without regard to an individual's actual well-being or is used as a means of proving a person's spirituality. Uh, I heard the term measure of conversion a lot in the YSA uh, Mormon congregations. Um, okay, what, what constitutes the kind of spiritual performance are we referring to? When does an authority overstep his or her bounds, leveling judgment when support is needed? Listen to the experiences of these Christians, wounded and overweighted by the demands of their leaders and their spirituality, and you will perhaps get a clearer picture. So we're going to go over some examples. My Bible study leader tells me that I haven't taken on the mantle as a spiritual head in my home. I should be praying more, taking authority in the Spirit. 
Then spiritual forces wouldn't be able to attack my family. Then my wife wouldn't be having menstrual problems, and my oldest son wouldn't be suffering from asthma. I guess their sickness is my fault. Quite a number of us wanted more information about how church finances were being spent. We wanted to know if more money could go to direct ministries, benevolences, things like that. When I asked some questions at an elders meeting, boy did the room get icy. Later I was told to stop trying to create a faction in the church. We sold our home and moved across country so I could work for this major ministry. After a year, they got on this weight thing. Because I'm overweight, I was told I had to lose weight. Because being overweight is a poor witness. My financial raises and even my employment were at stake. The congregation let me know they were disappointed in me because I asked for a two-month sabbatical, even though I've been pastoring here for 12 years. Basically on call night and day, and I've never even taken two weeks of vacation at the same time. I feel so discouraged. Our church has gotten into this heavy emphasis on homeschooling and having big families. Also on women wearing head coverings to show they're in submission. And no makeup. Eventually, it came out... Our best friend told us we aren't spiritual because our kids uh, is in I should say our kids ki our kid is in public schools. Okay, they're one kid, and I'm of the world, a term I hear often, uh, because I wear eyeshadow and lipstick. The controversy began. Can you believe it? When I raised a question in the adult Sunday school class. We were batting around a doctrinal issue, predestination, which I always thought of as a gray area. I disagreed with a teacher in a friendly spirit, but two days later I was told by the church ministry coordinator that I'd been argumentative with the teacher in front of everyone and that they would appreciate it if I would drop out of the class until further notice. My husband is convinced I should be praying one hour a day using this formula prayer he's into. I told him I tried that and it didn't seem right to me. All he said was, that's your whole problem. You can't accept anything on faith. I feel so substandard. Each of these incidents had similar dynamics at work. The person in need, whether it was the need for information, dialogue, support, acceptance, or counsel, was sent the message that they were less than spiritual or that their spirituality was defective. In several instances, shame was used in an attempt to get someone to support a belief or it was used to fend off legitimate questions. Hopefully you notice, as in the case of the weary pastor, that spiritual abuse can be heaped upon leaders as well as followers. By no means are we attacking leaders or spiritual leadership. We, we're exposing a phenomenon that is wounding many. Whatever the case, the result of spiritual abuse are usually the same. The individual is left bearing a weight of guilt, judgment, or condemnation, and confusion about their worth and standing as a Christian. It is... It's at this point we say that spirituality has become abusive. Is abuse too harsh a word? Looking at the phenomenon we are writing about from a slightly different perspective may help you understand why we go so far as to use the term spiritual abuse. We are well aware that the term may be controversial, and yet we are also convinced in light of other groundbreaking counseling in other fields that the use of the word abuse is warranted. Many are familiar with the recent breakthroughs in family, system, family systems counseling. Since the church is a spiritual family made of many families, since it's the family of God, we believe there is something very valuable to learn by looking at the basics of a healthy family system and what happens when that system becomes unhealthy. 
In a healthy functioning family system, the parents occupy a place of authority in order to provide the need meeting relationships, experiences and messages to children. Here parents affirm the personhood of their children while at the same time becoming ever wiser in their ability to give appropriate consequences for wrong behavior and teach and encourage in right behavior. It's true that even a good parent makes mistakes. That doesn't mean he is abusive. Sure, he's there in part to meet the needs of his children, but he's also a human being who is learning and growing too. On the other hand, when a parent uses his or her position to force their children to perform or to think a certain way, um, or uses a too harsh standard to judge by, or uses the position of power to gratify his or her own needs for importance, power, emotional, or even sexual gratification, then the parent has crossed the line into abuse. The family, which is supposed to be the child's one sure safe space, becomes an unsafe place. The relationships that are supposed to help and support instead use, abuse, and tear down. When a child trusts and then is emotionally, verbally, physically, or sexually used for an adult's gratification, that is abuse. Likewise, those in spiritual positions of authority can violate our trust. It is possible to become so determined to defend a spiritual place of authority, a doctrine, or a way of doing things, or a particular church, um, uh, I lost my place here, uh, Spirit, a doctor, a way of doing things that you wound and abuse, you, you wound and abuse anyone who questions or disagrees or doesn't behave spiritually in the way you want them to. When your words and actions tear down another or attack or weaken a person standing as a Christian or a Mormon to gratify you, your position or your beliefs, while at the same time weakening or harming another, that is spiritual abuse. There are spiritual systems in which what people think, how they feel, and what they need to do or want does not matter. People, people's needs go unmet. In these systems, the members are there to meet the needs of the leaders, the needs for power, importance, intimacy, intimacy value, really self-related needs. These leaders attempt to find fulfillment, through the religious performance of the very people whom they are there to serve and build. This is an inversion of the body of Christ. It is spiritual abuse. So I'm going to stop reading right there and uh, talk about some experiences in my life. So uh, I mentioned in my video, um, take it with a grain of salt, and when I was 11 years old, I told, I can't remember his name, uh, he was the teacher in a primary subclass. Primary is the class for children, Sunday school class for kids. And this was called Blazers. And you're about 10 or 11 to 12 years old when you're in this class. And it was just me and him uh, for a time. I was the only one in there. And I was having some issues. Uh, I was noticing that a lot of people in the church are Pharisee-like. And I had a problem with certain rules that set us apart from uh, other people or people in the world, like uh, drinking iced tea. My aunts fed me iced tea when I was five years old. And uh, when I was six years old, I left Kitimat and moved to Prince Rupert. And all of a sudden, uh, we're having family home evening, and my parents bring up that iced tea is against the word of wisdom. And in my child mind, I could not understand how my aunts, who are non-members, would feed me this devil drink that is somehow unhealthy for me and going to kill me prematurely. You know, and so I expressed these issues with the, uh, with the teacher of that class, and he's an older gentleman, and his reaction was immediate, You're emotionally vulnerable to the devil! Oh! Satan's working on you. Okay, let's let's say that's the truth. So, what do I do about it? Where's the counsel on how to, um, you know, interact 
with that? Where's the counsel on what steps I should take if I'm one of those people who's somehow born extra vulnerable to Satan? First of all, how do you think that makes a little kid feel when you say that? Secondly, in Stephen Hassan's book, Freedom of Mind, teaching people that there's something inherently wrong with them if they question or dissent is a cult red flag. Okay? Where's the loving arm around your shoulder and the comforting words in the wise counsel? What do you do if you're extra vulnerable to the devil. Okay, so uh, another instance. This I mentioned in one of my previous videos that I've been, I use the term verbally crucified. And this is what happens when you say something that the rest of the congregation just immediately turns on you because you uh, said the wrong thing in church and you're spewing some kind of false doctrine that they all then have to get on their moral high horse and immediately attack and disapprove of the person who just said it. So, this is uh, in Calgary. This would have been between 2010-2012. Um... There's there's a lesson about above the Lord's line and below the Lord's line. Is uh, is uh, coffee above the line or below the line? Is energy drinks above the line or below the line? And the teacher, brother Kyle, the uh, second counselor in the first president or in the bishopric, said, uh, "Yeah, by the way, if you disagree with any of this, you will raise your hand and let's discuss it." Well, um, I was the only one who was willing to disagree, and I was trying to do it in a friendly spirit and uh, immediately half the congregation is getting on their moral high horse they're disapproving they're making that disapproval loud and clear and it's just like in South Park red hot Catholic love where Father Maxi goes to the Vatican and he's like oh, I can't have Catholic priests have sex with women rebel 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 and the other half of the congregation, very cowardly, is staying silent. I'm the only one who had the guts to say anything. I'm getting lambasted for it. I'm getting roasted for it. And apparently that's my fault. And after that uh, encounter is over, my cousin Rob says, I'm so mad at what you did. Well, why? What did I do wrong? You know, in Mormonism, you do not rock the boat. You accept. You do not question. Thou shalt not question. It's not a real rule. It's an unspoken rule. You don't do it. You go along. A lot of people are very afraid to speak up, as that scenario pointed out. And the whole thing, honestly, it was a goddamn witch hunt. And guess who the witch was? That's not the first time that's happened in my life. It's actually probably the last. Because, uh, yeah, I didn't attend much after that. And I, as I said in that video, I've learned a lot. I've learned to placate sensibilities. Because if you speak out of turn, you get roasted. You get immediately roasted by a majority. I was going to church and someone came up to me and uh, they want to have this uh, extracurricular activity where people are going to dress up in different clothes and disguise themselves and we're going to guess uh, who, who's who, you know, or something like that. And so someone asked me, uh, one of the organizers, if I would get a haircut for this event because I have this. And I said no. I was not interested. And immediately him and six or seven other people, including my cousin Rob, immediately turn on me. And again, they're making their disapproval very crystal clear. They do not respect this. They do not think anyone should have it. And um, in the church, there is a phrase, we should be willing to do whatever the brethren suggest. I heard this countless times in Confederation Park Ward. Okay, so when something is suggested to you, especially when it's conformity to fitting the mold, if someone suggests that to you and you're not willing to do it, you're not willing to obey God. You're not willing to obey the gospel. 
You're not willing to submit to the mold and fit the mold. And therefore, everyone now has the right to disapprove of you and tell you that you're being a bad person. This happens in Mormonism all too often. Mormon culture, in Alberta and Utah especially, is rife with spiritual abuse. It is part of the culture. It is an inherent part of the culture. And I can see why it would be an inherent part of the culture. Because it goes back to Joseph Smith, who's uh, gratifying his sexual desires by using his authority and charisma to coerce women into getting into these relationships with him. And uh, it, when, you, when you study church history in the LDS church, the church is always the victim. Everyone who's against the church is always the bad guy. They never tell you the outlying issues. And um, yeah, they don't talk about this stuff. And there's a reason why they don't talk about this stuff. Because it doesn't make them look good. They know that they have a very messy history, that it looks really bad, and they don't want their members to know about it. And they don't discuss it. The tarring and feathering of Joseph Smith is another good example of that. Why was he tarred and feathered? Well, according to the teachings of the presidents of the church, Joseph Smith manual, some guy, and, and this is true, some guy saw his name spelled wrong in the church records and decided to be part of that mob. And so they give you a reason for someone who rebelled against the church and did something horrific and those foster babies died of pneumonia because the door was wide open in the middle of winter and uh, you're left to come to the conclusion that people rebel against the church for the stupidest reasons. But they don't teach you any of the outlying issues. The reason why that mob formed, what the outlying issue was, is Joseph Smith was grooming Nancy Marinda um, Johnson, who was, I don't know if she was 12 or 16, but she's a teenager. He's grooming her to be one of his plural wives. There are people in the family, uh, whether Fawn Brody got it wrong or not, in, uh, in uh, No Man Knows My History, who... There are people in the family who obviously see that what this is going on. They don't like it, and they want him castrated. And the doctor chickens out, so they tar and feather him instead. Now, what did what they do was right? No. Uh, did those babies die? Yes. But there's an outlying issue here where it's like, yeah, I can kind of understand why the mob would be, you know, angry with this uh, ecclesiastical leader who's using his his uh, religious authority and position to uh, coerce young women into being uh, maybe not romantically involved with him right now, but he's grooming them to be romantically involved with him later on in Nauvoo, okay? Like, well, of course spiritual abuse exists in the LDS, you know, and... Uh, yeah, it exists in the family too. In patriarchal family units where the father and the head of the house is not to be questioned, where my father and his brothers are overreacting and flipping their lids because of the influence of Babylon. And again, I give that Captain Planet uh, episode uh, example where I'm watching Captain Planet in grade nine and... Um, the whole point of the episode is that we're breeding like rats. We need to have small families and don't have more families than the world can hold. And instead of asking me what I thought about this messaging, my father's freaking out. I can't ever watch the show ever again. Um, there, there's no discussion with his children on what kind of effect these shows are having on their kids' minds, what their kids think of the show. It's always, oh my God, the world is invading my home. You know, and this, this is the way I was raised my entire life. No voice. No one's having conversations with me, you know. Why is it wrong for me to uh, speak up in Sunday school and question, you know, what Brother Kyle is saying when Brother Kyle invited us to do so? There, in every example in this book, 
the victim is blamed. Yeah, the victim is blamed. You know, it's always your fault. You're the problem. You're not spiritual enough. You're not praying enough. You need to get down on your knees like Enos and don't come back up again until you believe. And it's like, there are people, there are ex-members of the church who have prayed like Enos. They have not gotten an answer. They've heard nothing but silence. And somehow something's wrong with them because Moroni 10, 4, and 5 isn't working for them. For whatever reason, it's always their fault. We can't quite pin down what it is, but the fault obviously lies with them. Because if you can't get Moroni 10, 4, and 5 to work for you, then there's something wrong with you. God always answers prayers. You must be like Laman and Lemuel, somehow. And it's like, well, I'm not whining and complaining. You know, I'm not... Jerry said she was praising God. You know, I'm trying to praise God. I'm trying to realize my faults. I'm trying to do my best to repent, you know, at various times in my life. But, you know, I've sincerely prayed in the dark soul of the night and got no answer. And I'm not saying it's God's fault, but for whatever reason, it's not working. And every time I've tried to come back to church, every reactivation attempt has failed because they're not interested in talking about the right issue. Uh, just like Jerry's pastor, they're not interested in getting, in getting to the heart of what my issues, what my concerns, what my problems are, why I would be hurt... They're hurt that I'm not accepting, that I'm not bending over backwards to accept this wonderful doctrine in my life. How could I reject this? They're hurt that I'm going to hell because I have any kind of issue with it whatsoever. They don't want to know what my issue is. They'd rather, they'd rather tout a New Testament passage where Jesus says you must forget about your concerns. So, the real issues never get talked about. They fester. You're expected to perform. You're expected to fit a mold. You're expected to read your scriptures and pray every day until you're feeling it. And uh, <coughs> you're expected to have the same sensibilities as the rest of the congregation. You're expected to get your hair cut. You're expected to espouse the same life ideas and life same life opinions or you're subscribing to the doctrines of men. You know, and it doesn't matter if I grew up in British Columbia and uh, it's more liberal there and I was raised in the liberal public school system and half my family's Mormon and I had a relationship with the non-Mormon half and uh, some of those ideas have been an influence on what I think. I mean, that's to be expected. No, I just have to sacrifice all that and think what I'm told in the church and I'm a bad person if I don't. Okay? I have been spiritually abused all my life. I have carried a tremendous weight of guilt and shame since I was 10 years old and I became very withdrawn and very guarded, never revealed what I really thought or how I really felt to anybody, tried my best to be a good kid, stay out of trouble, stay away from a lot of things that a lot of people were involved in. I had no friends in high school. I wasn't even friends with Rick Gordon, who was going to be watching this, uh, when uh, he was doing bad stuff in his life. I ditched that guy all throughout grade 9. Didn't have nothing to do with him. Didn't have nothing to do with anybody. It wasn't until uh, our mutual friend Jerry came back from Utah that we started socializing again. You know, I sacrificed a lot to be a good kid, to stay out of trouble, and to keep my head down. Uh, and um, somehow I've been faulted for it my entire childhood, my entire teenage years, until it got to the point where I mentioned in why I left Mormonism that... Uh, I couldn't take it anymore, and I started drinking. You know, because my family does not give an F about how anyone lower on the totem pole than them feels. 
and they think they can just use the gospel to walk all over you. They did it to me. They did it to Wendy. This is why my sister lives all the way on the other side of the country, because in her adult life, people in our family have been using their authority positions and using the gospel to tell her that she's a bad person and to walk all over her. Okay, we've been treated like doormats. And the older we got as teenagers, the more like doormats we were treated. The more we started to individualize, the more like doormats we were treated. And they think that this behavior is perfectly okay. You know what? I'm getting into 40 minutes here. I'm going to stop right there. I'm sure a lot of people are going to have a lot of problems with everything I just said. And I'm telling you right now, I don't care. Okay? I was spiritually abused in the LDS church. It is, in my opinion, a very spiritually abusive culture. And uh, the Pharisees abound in Alberta and Utah. Okay? They rule. When 90% of the congregation thinks that Coca-Cola is against the word of wisdom, guess what? If you drink Coca-Cola, you're breaking the commandments. Okay? Brother Kyle... Uh, in another lesson, he was like, oh, would you share the gospel with the, uh, the guy with the mullet on the bus? And I wanted to say, but I was too afraid to, well, uh, when are you going to give the guy with the mullet on the bus a gift card to the barber? Immediately upon exiting the waters of baptism, or does he have a three to six month grace, grace period first? Okay? When we're making jokes in Sunday school after saying that the Lord's standard is clean cut, clean shaven, not like those Sikhs and Muslims, they have a false standard, and then we're cracking jokes, except for those rebel bishops in BC, what's going on here? Do we honestly think that clean cut, clean shaven is the standard, or you're less than, or your terrestrial kingdom material? This is the attitude. This is the attitude that I've largely seen in the YSA, the young single adult wards, the, for the nine years that I was a part of them. And it's the attitude that I've seen every time I've been back and forth between BC and Alberta. But it was obviously going on when my 11-year-old teacher is like, you're one of those people? You have critical thinking and, and you have uh, misgivings. Now how can Jesus Christ possibly forgive you? Oh! You're vulnerable to Satan. Get out of here. Okay? Take your book and go. I do not understand why any sane, rational person should take your religion seriously. And if you don't like me saying so, then you know what? You either need to wake up or you need to get lost. That's all I got to say about it. Goodbye.